Righty. Her lesson today is lesson 10, and the title of it is Hand to the Plow. And uh, uh, if you're a farmer, uh, you kind of kind of already know what it's talking about here, but you know, it's um, Jesus was good at laying out things, whether you were a farmer or whether you were a fisherman or whether you were a merchant or there were several different things that Jesus used in describing what the Christian walk is like. And it pretty much hits just about any, somewhere in the Bible, it hits pretty near just about any profession that you have. I mean, it even deals with uh, like bankers and stuff in 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 things. So you know, it uh, Jesus Jesus used a lot of illustrations, earthly illustrations, to uh, uh, portray a spiritual meaning, and that's exactly what a parable is. But uh, uh, and that's what he did, and and this w is not really a parable, but it's an illustration of of uh, uh, of something that is very important there. Hand to the plow. Our memory verse is Mark thirteen thirteen. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. For he that shall endure unto the end, sh the same shall be saved. Uh, I'm going to read a junior emphasis. We must hold true to Jesus to the end of our life. Let that sink in. We must hold true to Jesus to the end of our life. You know, it, it doesn't matter where we get started, so to speak. Now, however, the best thing to do is get started as soon as possible because you will avoid a lot of uh, scars and a lot of troubles if you get started as soon as possible. But, okay, say a person's in their middle age or later in life and they get started, that is great. But they're probably going to be suffering some scars and so it's best get started as early and hang on, and hang on to the end. That's almost everybody's intentions when they, when they get saved. That's their intentions, hang on to the end. Well, that's our intentions to hang on to the end. Let's hold true to that, hanging on to the end. That's what's most important. It doesn't make any difference how you start out. It's how you end. But like I say, the best thing to do is get started as early as possible. If we have in us the things of God, we cannot be shaken loose from Him. So, sounds like we need to get established in the things of God and hang on to those things because everything else is going to be shaken, it says. We do not need to fall into sin. That's one thing we don't have to do. We must keep pressing on toward heaven. Many people start to serve the Lord. Not so many, though, continue is this bad thing about it. Many turn away from Him. That's bad. Um, but we must not turn away. That's, that's, that's what we need to keep in the forefront of our mind at all times. Not to turn away from God. Those who, those who do, those, okay, we must not turn away. Those who do cannot go to heaven. Never look back to sinful things. And so that's, that's very important. Uh, Luke 9 and 62, we'll read the first reading there. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and look it back as fit for the kingdom of heaven. You know, I've done some plowing in my time. I have never plowed with a horse and a plow. And this is what it's kind of referring to, is a horse and a plow. You know that horse? They always had the reins tied to them so that they could, if he got going this way, they pull on the rein this way to keep him going straight. If he got going this way, 
but they set their eye on a object across the field at the other end of the field. They set their eye on that and shot for that that object. Well, we set an eye on heaven, and we're shooting for heaven. Is what we're shooting for uh, to to go. And you know, we want just a straight a path as we can go. We don't want to veer off this way, veer off this way. Because if you let the horse do whatever he wants to, you're going to have a furrow that is like this. And so, a wavering back and forth like that. Well, if we don't set our eyes towards heaven, we're going to do the same thing. And you leave it long enough, and instead of just wavering back and forth, it's just going to go like that and we're going to be lost forever and so it's very important that we set our eye on the goal that we have and keep our eye on that goal and not let it let it turn no man having put his hand to the plow starting a plow a fur across the field and looking back wishing to be back where he was before let's don't look and see where we've been Let's look to see where we're going. You know, you see a lot of people when they're walking, while well, they'll turn around and they'll look. And, of course, uh, it's kind of a joke with the wife and I. Well, look, he's looking back to see where he's been. He's not looking where he's going or, you know. But, you know, we need to set our eyes on where we're going and set, fix our eyes on Christ. If we're turning around and Christ keeps going, we may not be able to keep we may lose ground between Christ and us and the further we are the more lukewarm we become and so it's very important that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and stay as close to him as we can looking back wishing to be back where he was before such a man will never finish the furrow this is like a man starting to serve Jesus. Then he, thinks of his, then he thinks of his old life. And he looks back. And he wishes for it. And he turns away from Jesus. How sad that is. How sad. You know, you've seen, we've seen people get saved and before the next year, why well, they've turned their back on Jesus. And you know, the, yes, that's bad too. But you take people that's been saved for 30, 40 years and then turn their back on Jesus. You know, either way they're lost. But, you know, it just seems like one might, we might conjure up in our mind that one's worse than the other. But, you know, they're both bad. We need to set our eyes on Jesus whether we've been saved one day or whether we've been saved 80 years. Keep our eyes on, on Jesus. It's very important. He turns away from Jesus. No such person is fit for the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that's just bringing it out right plain, the way Jesus says. To be in God's kingdom, we, we must cut loose from sin, never to go back to it again. We must take hold of Jesus and never leave him. God has laid a straight line for us to plow spiritually. A holy life for us to live. He sets a goal for us to work toward. And what is that goal? Eternal life with Him. Oh my. Why would you want to turn back if you know good and well you stay true to Him, then you're going to inherit eternal life. Because if you turn away from Him, then you're going to be in eternal damnation. And what's the, what's the balance between that? It is way out of balance, I'll tell you. So it's, that's what's most important. The last thought is, remember, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. That uh, she did turn back. She did turn. She just turned around to look. And what happened? She turned into a pillar of salt there. Genesis 19, 26, it says, 
for his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Okay, let's go to uh, Hebrews 12 and 25, these few verses here. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shake the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Things which cannot be shaken. See that we refuse him, refuse not him that speaketh. Let's not refuse the Lord Jesus when he's speaking. Let's, let's always be in tune to what he says. Never say no to Jesus. That's part of the uh, commentary there. Never say no to Jesus. You know, um, we, we as children, uh, when we were children, you know, a no was a word that you didn't tell your folks. If they told you to go do some chores, you didn't say no. You maybe didn't want to do them, but you know you knew better than not. That you better you knew better than to say no to them. And and then another thing, as you we went to do them, sometimes we kind of wanted to hurry. I kind of wanted to hurry and get the thing done, but then it would conjure up in the back of my mind. If I don't do it right, I don't know how it is, but Dad will notice that, and and so I, and then I'll have to do it over and probably get scolded in between times and do it over again. So you know, this is the way we need to be with Jesus. If Jesus has something for us to do, gladly do it, and gladly do it right. And that's what's most important. Long before this time, God spoke and gave the Ten Commandments. He shook, shook the earth. There was thunder, lightning, smoke, and fire. Moses told the people what the Lord said. Those who refused him or disobeyed Moses were punished. Now Jesus has come from heaven and spoken to us. He has told us to come to him and be saved. If we refuse him, we will certainly be punished. He promised that he will shake again. He will shake both earth and heaven. He, he will shake spiritually. Why? To shake off all loose things, all make-believe things. You know that's one thing we don't want to do. We don't want to. We don't want to uh, be loosely serving Jesus or pretending to serve Jesus. If we are, then that shaking is going to knock us off. It's going to. It's going to. It, it, it's. We need to possess instead of just. Professing. Professing. If we possess, then yes, we possess. Possess. I mean, if we uh, profess. I get my words all mixed up here. But, uh, but you know, if we say we're a Christian, we better be a Christian. That's, that's, that's what it all boils down to. People who pretend to be saved but are not, that's what I'm talking about. People who pretend to be saved. People who pretend to be so spiritual, you know. And, you know, we are only spiritual because God made us that way, not because of some great thing that we conjured up in our mind, but it's because God 
made us, put us that away. Holiness is what he requires of us. People who do outside forms but do not worship God in their hearts is the same kind of people. People who follow men but not God, same kind of people. Them's the people that's going to be shaken off there. These will be shaken off. Things which cannot be shaken will remain. What things... The commentator asks us, what things? Well, let's go, to, let's go to Hebrews 12 and 28 then. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptable with reverence and godly fear. And then the next verse is, for, God, for our God is a consuming fire. Things, what things? I left you with that. What things? Things God has set in place. You know, if God has set something in place, it's established right there. It's more solid than the rock of Gibraltar. You know, you know you've, heard, you've heard that, that expression. Uh, I think there's an a insurance company that's, that, that, that uh, advertises that away. But it's more stable than the Rock of Gibraltar. Um, God establishes things and they cannot be moved. It's just like, it's just like one thing God can't do. God can't lie. That's established. Well, that's the same way here. When God establishes something, that's the way it is. And it doesn't make any difference whether time makes any difference at all, whether it's 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. What God said is established and is still true today. Things God has set in place. People who are in Christ. Are we in Christ? If we're grounded in Christ... We're as solid as the Rock of Gibraltar also. More solid than that. But it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be that away. We can't do it on our own. Or otherwise we're going to be the pretenders is what we will be. Those who are born again. Those who worship God in spirit and in truth. Those who obey Him. These will not be shaken off. That's the answer to what things there that was, that was asked there. What things? Things that are established in the things of God. The kingdom of God cannot be moved or shaken off. He reigns in the hearts of his saved ones. To all, to all in that kingdom, grace is provided. That's talking about us as Christians. That's what he's talking about. <sighs> to all in that, uh, in that kingdom, grace is provided, sufficient to withstand all shakening. Let us have grace. Take it. Claim it. By it, we may serve God acceptable. I think I'm saying that word or it's acceptable unto God is what it's talking about. We must serve with reverence and godly fear. We must serve with reverence and godly fear. That is so important to us there. It is of God. It is eternal. And then it goes on as the, as the commentator says, if you're not, if you're not, if you haven't repented, he says, repent and take Jesus. He will put you in his kingdom, then serve him all your life. You will be established in the things that God wants us to be established in. That is so, so very, very important. I want to go back and read that verse 29 again. It's a little little short verse there. For our God is a consuming fire. For our God is a consuming fire. Remembering who and what God is. A consuming fire. The man who does not labor to serve God in the way prescribed will find that fire to consume him 
which would otherwise have consumed his sin. That's an Adam Clark statement. It's the it's commentary in your in your cordly there, and I thought that was very good. That very fire that consumes you could have consumed your sin, is what he's saying there. Wouldn't you rather that it consumed the sin and not you? That's right. I, I think that's what Adam Clark's telling us here, and and that's what's most important there, that. It consumes um, the sin and not not us there. Let's go to verse uh, verse thirteen here. Well, um, one more thing. I was looking for that there. You know, the the consuming fire, the fire consumed the sin rather than you. Let's look at the three Hebrew children. They were established in God. They had their minds made up that they wasn't going to do what the king had said because it went against God's law. They knew what the consequences was going to be. They were going to wind up in the fire, in a literal fire. And you know, they told the king, they says, well, have it known that we're not going to worship this idol that you've put up. And if God, God's able to deliver us from the fire, that's up to him. But we're ready to march into the fire no matter what. We're going to, we, we are going to stand firm for Jesus. And that's the way we have to be. The same way we have to stand firm. What happened? They walked in, they was they're shoved into the fire. They probably probably pushed into the fire. What happened? They were established. And when they came out, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but when they came out, not a hair on their head was singed. Their clothes were still intact. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. What happened to the, the, to the ones that were shaken off? They lost their lives. So it was a real, that goes to prove you, it was a real fire. And see, that's, that was a good example of what Adam Clark was talking about here is the ones that shoved them in there, they wound up dying. We don't know how many there was that died, but they, it says that they, there were some of them that perished because of it. But the three Hebrew children, because they stood for what God wanted them to stand for, they survived. And God was in their presence at the same time. And so it was, it's very important. You know, that's an encouragement to us to stand no matter what. All right, now we'll go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way escape, that ye may be able to bear it. You know, that's a good verse right there to memorize. When we're in a Stress, stress, stressful, or a um, um, temptation, or even a concern, or a, um, uh, a downtime. This is a good, good, good uh, uh, verse here to to go back to because that to me that's a promise. That's a promise that God will not put more than what we can. Take. Amen. Now we can't do it on our own. Nope. We have to have God. We have to have the Holy Spirit leading us and us following God to be able to do it. But we can do it because He says we can do it through His grace. And that's what's so important. If we will only just think that whatever temptation comes on us, we can get through it. 
Whatever discouragement. I think discouragement's included in this because it can wind up to be a temptation. But discouragement and trials and, and, and all of that, God does not put, put too much on us. Job had a trial and temptation and discouragement and who was for who 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 was on his side his wife no she wasn't on his side i think he had three friends so called friends they wasn't even on his side you know he went through it on his own but he knew he knew that he had his mind set on that gold and that's exactly what we need to. You know, his wife said, well, why don't you just get out of it, curse God, and die? And you'll be, out, you'll be done with it, you know. Job didn't, didn't see it that way. He says, maybe I don't know where God is, but God knows where I am. And I think he could have written this scripture right here that there's no temptation. After he went through that temptation, and he, I, he believed that, that there was no temptation too great but what God would lead him through it. And, you know, because it, it, it works out that way. It just, it, that's, that's, what, that's the way he lived. That's, that's, that's what he wanted. And God helped him through it. And when it was all over with, look what God blessed him then with. We do not need to fall. Does someone think, I would like to hold true to Jesus, but I can't. I cannot keep from sinning. Is that true? Or is the devil lying to you? That's what it is. The devil is lying to you. Don't believe a liar. He's been a liar from the very start. Don't follow after a liar. Follow after the truth. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is a common to man. man. <coughs> Other people have had the same temptations. You know, a temptation that you go through, there's probably been already somebody that's went through that temptation. You know, we think, well, you know, it may be a, an earthly person. It might, it might be a person that, that is a godly person that went through the same temptation, went through it, may, it was flying colors, so to speak, and may not even be in this world anymore, but went through that temptation. And, you know, maybe, maybe that person is still alive, and you can talk to them about it. But if you go through a temptation that you can't find nobody's went through, you know Jesus went through it. And you know, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, he's already went through that temptation. He knows where the, uh, uh, tr uh, the trip wires and the downfalls and, uh, and uh, trips are all at. He knows where they're at and he can lead us through. We, that's, that's our main concern is to keep our eyes on Jesus there. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. Other people have had have the same temptations. God will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. He will not let a temptation be too strong for you. And that that does not mean on your own, but that is with the Spirit of God leadness. He will with the temptation make a way of excuse. Escape. Not excuse, but escape. You never have to sin. That's the answer to that question up there. You know, some people says, well I can't I can't I can't go through this world without sinning. Well that's only the devil talking. Now Jesus is talking here and he says you never have to sin. There is always a way to do right. Look for it. It is there. If sin has you bound, rebuke the devil and go to Jesus. Repent and Jesus will set you free. And that is a promise also there that for anybody that, that will accept it. It's a promise to all 
but there'll be only few that will accept that there. Philippians 3 and 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Keep pressing toward the mark. You know, you get halfway through the field on that plow. Why stop now? What good is that going to do to stop now? Well, that's the same way the Christian life is. Keep going. Keep going. I ain't going to say it's going to get better, but I know that at the end it is better. I know I did not use right uh, the proper grammar, but I want to make a point. Don't give up. It does not work. Paul had not apprehended all yet. He could learn more. You mean Paul could learn more? That man had so much knowledge and so much uh, bringing up and knowing so much about things, but yet he says he didn't have all knowledge. He could still learn. Well, I've got a long ways to go then because I know I don't know as much as Paul does. But, you know, we know what we know, and that's what God is going to judge us by. That's what Jesus is going to judge us by, by what we know. But, you know, every opportunity we have to know something, then we need to grasp hold of that. I know there's, I know there's other Christians that has a whole lot more knowledge than I do in the Christian things. But you know, my eye is set on that, what God has for us to, uh, to, to learn, has for us to know, has for us to reward God, and that's what we're striving for. And as we go, we learn. And you know, I love, I love when things I haven't thought of or haven't uh, realized, and when that light flashes on, Hey, that's, that's something I can grab a hold of. That's something that I can live by. And a lot of times during the week, I need that very thing sometimes. And so God's faithful to us. God will allow us to know what we need to know at the time that we need to know it. Paul could learn more. He could do better. He could grow in grace. He wanted to. He was reaching forth unto these. And you know, that's the same way we are. We can, do, we can learn more. We can do better. We can grow in grace. We want more. We want more. And that's, that's like Paul was, like the, like the commentator said here. We can reach forth unto these. But he forgot those things which were behind. He did not wish to go back to his old life. Not a one time did Paul say that he wished he was back persecuting the church after he got saved. After he got saved, not one time. He was the one being persecuted and he still didn't turn back and say, that he wished he was on the other end. Because why? He had his eyes set on that prize out there. I pressed toward the prize, mark for the prize. The prize was the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Leave all that stuff behind and press towards the high calling. God called him to be holy. God calls us to be holy, to be like Jesus. He, he, he called Paul to be like Jesus. He also calls us to be like Jesus, to go to heaven. Paul wanted this. What about us? Do we want it? How hard are we pressing towards that? Paul wanted it. He pressed on. He did not turn back. We must press on to never look back to sin. 
Let's look at our memory verse now. And if we shall be hated of all men, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that starts out well, the same shall be saved. I see some eyes are looking kind of funny at me here. I read it wrong. But he that shall endure unto the end, not starts out well, but endures to the end, the same shall be saved. I read that purposely wrong just to kind of catch your eyes and see what happens here. It's not how you start out like I said at the first there. This is our memory verse. I'm going to reread it and read it correctly this time. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The church of God and the people of the world are on opposite sides. Different, different spirits. Uh, they, they serve different masters. Therefore the world hates the church as it hates Christ. For my name's sake, he says, because we are his. We have taken the name of Christ on us. We have taken the name of God, the church of God. We've taken that name. And you know, we have to be worthy of that name. We have to be in obedience to that name or otherwise we're, we're not the church of God. We're church of whatever, of something else. And, and that's what he's talking about. We need to be what God wants us to be or otherwise we're going to be shaken off. And that shaking is going to be a, it's a, it's a rather sharp uh, shakening too. And we need to be established in Jesus Christ or otherwise we will be shaken off and lost forever. He that shall endure... Remain true to Jesus. Continue until the end of, of the life of faith and obedience. He shall be saved. Receive the final phase of salvation, the resurrection of the body in an incorruptible state, entrance to heaven and a crown of life. That's what we're striving for. But you know, we have to work. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. We have to keep in tune with Jesus. We have to... Uh, stay in love with Jesus. We, you know, I mean, we, we all we need to do is follow Him, like He tells us to. No promise of this is ever given to one who begins to live for Christ and then turns back into sin, like I read the verse the first time. It is for those only whom. Death finds abiding in Christ, who endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. All right, I want to I read a little, little summary here. Putting our hands to the plow or starting the Christian life, we must never turn back. If we do, we are lost. It takes determination beforehand. It takes firm holding on to Christ when all is dark. It takes the Holy Spirit of God within our heart. It takes Jesus living in our life, living his life through us is what it takes for us to make heaven our home. That's the goal for each and every one of us. That's the goal that, that, that Paul had set for him, for himself, was to make heaven his home. He was anxious to get there. He was ready to get there. And he did everything he could to strive for that crown of life. Let's make Paul our example. Let's follow after the example of Paul. You know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But you know, if I go astray, why don't you still follow Christ? 
Well, Paul made it. I feel that Paul made it. So we, we now can, can follow, follow the way Paul followed. Don't follow Paul, but follow the way he followed and follow Christ. And I, I know that, that we can receive that crown also. I'll leave it with you. Amen.